You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and that over there is Matt Reynolds, and it is question and answer Thursday again. I'm not sure if you can tell, but my eye is much better than last week. It's completely healed. You don't look but like But your that. mustache is significantly longer. Thank you. It continues to... Are you hitting it with clippers at this point, or are you just, are you just hitting it with scissors? No, yeah, just scissors a little bit here to keep it yeah, out, the in the middle the out of my mouth. Yeah, because you don't you don't want to you don't want to eat you don't want to get a bunch of food on it. Yeah, don't want to do that. Um, from time to time, when I'm sleeping, I will inhale some of it, but uh-huh. it's okay. Mm-hmm. Do you put any product on it? Nope, nothing at all. There's nothing on it right now, but uh, good wishes and clean living. <laughs> I thought you might go a different direction. Nope, <laughs> you'd be giving mustache rides. It could you maybe there's could be something on there. Mm-mm, nothing there. Nothing there. Nothing. But, Maybe a no, little, mustra- ma- no mustache rides for Scott Hambrick. No, maybe a little coffee. <laughs> Speak about it, it's on there. <laughs> Have you noticed, like, I've, you know, your mustache is much longer than mine, but mine's pretty long. I don't, I get the sun shining in on my, my face here. It's pretty long. And uh, the only real problem I have is, like, if I sneeze or blow my nose. Oh. And then, and then my wife will be like, why is your mustache all wet? <laughs> I was <laughs> like, well, it's not. Like, I'm a five year old, like, I'm in kindergarten. You know, blowing bubbles out my nose. Blowing the uh, farmer blow or the snot rocket's a lot more difficult with uh Yeah, because because seventy percent of it still shoots out onto the ground, but thirty percent goes directly into the mustache I whiskers. To, I have to kind of retract the mustache. That's right. Yeah. But then it's kinda like it's kinda like a mustache wax. Kind of. And you can just you can just comb it through and but just salty. It, it'll it'll harden over time. <laughs> All right, let's answer some questions. What we got? What you got for me today? Well, well got some winners. I, you know, before before you and I record, I record with Carl Shoot the online great books. I was podcast. wondering you were in a you were on a I saw you were on a call before we started. Yeah, we record from one to three, and then I record with you from three until you black out, and then uh, I go eat lunch or dinner. And, I was gonna uh, say that's a late lunch. Carl Carl's like, good mustache. So thank you. He said I could do that in about five days, <laughs> 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 which is probably true. Yeah. Who do you think has more um, a more typhotic back, you or or Carl? Shoot, and and are you two the most typhotic staff members at Barbell Logic? There's no question about that. I don't know Clearly. about the two of us. I don't know about the two. It's of us. weird because you're long legged and short torsoed, and he's long torsoed and short legged. But you're both. You got you got a back like a like a question mark. Yeah, if he had my legs or I had his torso, we'd be monsters. I'd be six seven if I had his torso. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Be Kurt Serber. Matt, I'm starting another podcast. Are you? About yeah. what? The Music and Ideas podcast. Oh, that's so, so I do the Christmas show? Yeah, it's like that. It's, it's like that. Christmas show? It's that. But it's have, me. You la- have you released any episodes yet? March 17th. It'll be twice a month. It'll be okay. it's me and Carl and a lady named Michelle Hawkins, who is a music uh, PhD professor, and uh, she's a member of Online wow. Great Books. And so so she knows out. her stuff. She knows her stuff, yeah. Is it mostly jazz? Is it mostly jazz stuff? No, no. We're gonna do whatever. Like she's never even listened to Patsy Cline. She's never heard oh, a Patsy Cline song. She never heard. Oh, she's never heard it. But she's a music professor, right? And I was like, Oh, well, that's Michelle. <laughs> we're gonna do Patsy Cline like live. Like we're not gonna let you listen to right. it and then do a show about it. Like we're gonna listen to it on the show. Oh, and then see her. Reaction. Yeah, I mean, you know, so we're gonna we're gonna do all kinds of stuff. Um, the first show was uh, Brahms' Third Symphony. And okay. the second one's going to be Louis Armstrong's West End Blues. And then I don't know. So good. Yeah. And then we'll go from there. We'll see. Where were we? We were driving. We were on a long road trip once. And uh, you did. You took me through the entire history of jazz. <laughs> and I remember listening to the West End through, Blues. Through Hawaii, uh, Iowa. Yeah. So we're it, might, it, it might have been on. Yeah. It was on the way up to see Father Floater after we wrecked your Civic. <laughs> the Accord. Deer. Yeah. No fun. Yeah. We're going to do that. It's going to be good. You know, all the podcasts I do are exactly the same. I have well, like sure. I have like the subject matter expert, and then I know something about it, and then I like clarify and land jokes, and I'm the color guy. Yeah, you're you're the color man on every podcast. On every podcast, they're all they're all exactly the same. It's just some of them are you know 
hypertensive co-host and others are kyphotic, <laughs> kyphotic co-hosts. And, and then I got Michelle, you know. <laughs> I've been taking that lisinopril. I'm not as hypertensive as you used to be. That's good. Tristan it's, says that he works as a police officer. In wait, a, Tristan? Tristan, T-R-S-T-O-N. What? That's a, that's a really weird name. I know. Tristan. Let's guess this. Hold on. Let's guess this a guy's age. Because he's not 50 with an age. With no. A name like Tristan. Uh, yeah. He has a Gmail account here, so he has a little avatar. So I can see a little small picture of him. So I have an All idea right. here. He's 27. I, I bet you're right. I okay. bet, from looking at the picture, that's, I Based think that's only right. on his name. He says he works as a police officer in a major city in Texas. Tristan, be arrested. <laughs> right. I have been strength training since uh, 2019. Uh, he says, I've seen major strength, uh, increases in strength, but my ability to run for medium to long distances has decreased. I ex expected to sacrifice some endurance for strength, but now that I've gotten stronger, I was wondering if I had it. Blah, 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 blah. Sure. Okay. So there's two ways to approach this. One is... Are you required to pass an endurance test to be a police officer? And often you are, right? Similar to like the PFT in the Army of the Marines or whatever. Right. And so at some point as you approach that, you've got to, you've got to, it's just playing by the rules, right? Right. So we can argue that the rule sucks. There's no reason, like when would a police officer ever need to run two miles? That never happens. Well, he, sa but, he actually says, he, he doesn't mention anything about a test. He says, most of my chases are between 400 to 800 meters. Like he is yeah, right. that's exactly literally doing that's, that's a perfect. So, the, so does a police officer need to be able to run 400 to 800 meters? Sure. You bet. Got to catch that perp, hit him with that nightstick. God, that'd be a good job, wouldn't it? I mean, nope. outside of the potentially getting shot by riffraff. Oh, you just want a job hitting people with nice sticks. I just want to run people down. I want okay. to Terry Tate office linebacker, grab them, you know, left arm over their shoulder and then take the nightstick and just start over the head with the right hand. Hmm. That's what I want. That sounds like a great job. Yeah, but you have but to touch them, though. I'm not willing. To, I'm not willing to get stuck by the, uh, you know, by the heroin needles and whatnot. Mm. OK. By the way, coronavirus is out. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> Corona I have been. I have been. In the DFW airport twice in the last two days. Okay. And the Atlanta airport, which is the busiest airport in the world, twice in the last six days. So, and here's the funny thing. The number of people in those two airports, which are, I think Dallas is like maybe third or fourth. It's, it's, like, it's like Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas, Denver are the top four in the United States. The number of people that have masks on. That are like just the basic doctor piece of fabric mask is incredible. And right. it does nothing to protect you from the coronavirus. I haven't seen a single person with like a real legit, you know, respirator type mask that's got the, the filter on it. Right. But lots of people have that little paper mask on, like, like it's going to stop anything. Well, I'm not going to the airport anytime soon. Yeah. I did, I did lots of washing of my hands. And my wife sent me some some nice Germex with a like a hibiscus smell. So I would, if I rode the Sky Tram, the, and I have to hold on to the pole because I'm top heavy anyway, and then I'd have a backpack on. What? So I can't, dude. I can't. I can't balance myself on the Sky Tram. I'm like, I'm a. That thing takes off. I'll just. I just roll to the back. So I've got to hold on to the pole. But then I'm like, ah, I got coronavirus on my right hand. So I would immediately get off. I'd run to the bathroom. I'd wash my hands with hot, soapy water. Oh my and then gosh. I'd get the, then I'd get the anti antibacterial Germex. Germex it up. That sounds fun. It wasn't, but yeah, I'm not sometimes going you got to travel. What are you going to do? Yeah, he says that his strength increases have um, damaged his ability to run. And I don't think it's the strength increases, friend. Yeah. Although you probably, you could possibly weigh more, which would make it more difficult Um without doing additional running training, you, you just need to train your running um, unless you've gained an enormous amount of weight. I mean, there's a point where a power lifter uh, gets, becomes so heavy <laughs> that they can't run 800 meters, uh, sure. but you're probably not a super heavy weight. So uh, even, you know, you get up to 215, 220, and you're wearing your uh, protective gear and all of your kit on, you know, I don't know, maybe weigh 240. You can run 800 meters. You just need to sure. train your running more, friend. Yeah, like him being a police officer is kind of like being a – that's his sport. And so the thing that we would encourage you to do is as you get stronger and as you get bigger, you, you have to continue to do your sport 
which if you're a cop, you just got to run those, you know, 400s and 800s, which aren't very fun, in order to to stay used to that stuff mm-hmm. and stay conditioned for that. You don't have to do it very often. A couple times a week is probably enough. Yeah, your conditioning is probably the same as it was, but now you're a little bit heavier. You just got to, yeah, yeah just, just work on it. You can, ro- you, you know, you need to run. You can use your Echo Rogue bike, your Rogue Echo bike, I mean, uh, rower. Just work on that conditioning, but you still have to run. You'll be all right. Yeah. You get that speed back up there, and when you hit those guys, you'll hit them harder. And, and then uh, hit them with that nightstick. No, we don't want to hit them with a nightstick. No, pl- no police brutality. No, no police brutality. If you're running after somebody, are you not allowed to hit them with a nightstick? No, you're probably They're allowed r- to. If somebody's running from you? Yeah, you're probably allowed to. Okay. Steve says, I just bought a house with a two-car garage and built a platform following the art of manliness how-to. After doing so, I realized my garage is sloped. I put a level on my rack, and one side is three-eighths to one-half inch lower than the other. Okay. Should I shim it? I think it depends. I'm interested in your, in your answer to this. I think it depends. If it, if it slopes backwards, I think it's fine. Just leave it. I think if it slopes sideways, so it depends on mm. if his platform is turned, you know, which 90 degree angle it's sort of turned on. I don't mind a slope back. Most people struggle with getting their weight too far forward on their toes on their on a squat and a deadlift. So if it's sloped a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit backwards and you're like, like your like your racks are in your gym where your back is to the garage door. Mm-hmm. I don't think you need to shim it. I don't think it's that big of a deal. But if it's sideways and your left foot is. <laughs> is a half inch higher than your right foot, you got to shim it. That'd be my that'd be my opinion. What's your opinion? Yeah, uh, my racks are, they're in the garage. And the garage slopes, so it'll drain, you know, like good garages would be. And the, gra- the, the racks are uh, positioned so that you're either facing up or down the slope, depending on where you stand. It's fine. And the racks are bolted to the floor, so the racks aren't level. And there's a diff- there's a the the drop is about the same as yours there, Steve. But the platforms are shimmed. Our platforms are level, so when we deadlift, that bar isn't trying to roll out into the driveway. Now, see, I I would so it's important to me. Actually, I hurt my back one. The worst I've ever hurt my back deadlifting. I was doing a strong big strongman contest, like a it was like a pro strongman invitational, and they had us on a on a in a parking lot facing the audience and the and the weight sloped away from me mm-hmm. and toward the audience and it was a of course it was strong man so you could do straps and you could theoretically hitch and stuff and so it was a, just a standard deadlift max and it was called what they call wessels rules so different than powerlifting is if you miss an attempt you're out you can't redo the attempt on the same weight and so i got up to my third attempt and i was going for 725 and i turned around and put my back to the audience so the bar would want to roll towards my shin instead of mm. away. And I got ready to pull up and my straps on and the 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 head person of the the whole pro strongman organization in the United States came around and out tapped me on the shoulder and she her name is Dion and she said, You can't do that. I said, I can't do what? She said, you gotta face the audience. I was like, damn it. So I turned around and of course, the weight's trying to roll away from you. Yep. So you you roll it in on your shins. And I started, to, and I got the bar right, seven twenty five to like just below my knees, and sat there and shook. And it, I didn't hurt, didn't feel a pop, nothing. Couldn't get it. Set it down. Let the straps go, and took one step, and my right foot went literally completely numb and dead, and I just fell over sideways in front of the whole crowd, like fell over the barbell onto the concrete. Real embarrassing. What happened though? Yeah. I, something weird happened, like a nerve. I think it was like something happened with a disc or something. My sciatic nerve down my right leg and just shut that sciatic nerve down. It was almost, I mean, literally, it was like I didn't have a right leg. Like my right leg was dead and could not do anything. And I, <laughs> I just fell. I got up and kind of figured it out and it felt super weird. I remember walking. It was kind of at a festival. And I, I just walked around the festival for like three hours trying to just get blood flow in and whatever. And uh, of course, I I couldn't do the rest of the rest of the contest. I had to pull out. It's the only contest I've ever had to pull out of strongman. But yeah, man, it's. I think that if I were you, and it was rolling, until you get the thing fixed, make sure you deadlift and squat. Make sure it's it's rolling behind you, not in front of you. Yeah, shim that thing up. Um, if it's sloping left to right, you gotta shim everything. 
Um, but if it's uh, you got to shim it, yeah. But you know, listen, yeah, man, you can't do that. We do things the right way, and we're thoughtful. So just level everything up. I should have leveled yep. mine. Next time I move them, I'll be putting some flat washers under there, or cutting some shim stock and putting them under there, and the racks will be level too. Yep, we do things the right way. All right. I'm confused as to why your racks aren't level because I bolted them directly and to the floor to the, to the concrete. Okay, okay. Your platform's built around the rack. That's right. Okay, okay. I My platforms it. are kind of a T shape, and the long leg yeah, of the yeah. T is just shoved up inside the rack. Yeah, okay, okay. Got it. Uh, so uh, this guy says, uh, hey, Scott and Matt. That's My us. wife got me a rack for Christmas, and I can now start LP properly. <laughs> We're a little behind, everybody. That's right. Um, got it at Sam's. It's a Joe we- Weeder version. He says, uh, I have the basics, so I can do all the lists, but here's what I really need, and I don't know what to get next. Platform. I'm thinking this is next because lifting on carpet sucks. Shoes, belt, decent barbell, more plates. What do you think? What, prioritize? Yes. Hey, let's do this. This will be fun. I mean, we've answered this question 400 times. I'm going to say three, two, one, and we're going to say the thing he needs to buy first. Okay. Three, two, one. Platform. Barbell. Okay. You can't be deadlifting and squatting on carpet. I would. I, I don't disagree. I was just interested to see if we'd say the same thing. You said barbell. I said barbell. You can't. You can't lift on a Walmart barbell. That's not gonna work. Yeah, he's got one of the chrome ones with the Allen key, Allen yep. nut wrench bolt. That's whatever. crap. Yeah, I mean, great. honestly, man, you gotta you gotta fix all that stuff. I have a client who's a a good client, and he's a good dude, and he he coaches other guys and like lifestyle stuff. He's he's a likable guy. Kind of a similar guy to Brett McKay. And I started coaching him. And he's squatting in his Chuck Taylors. Yep. I was on the plane yesterday flying home and I was like, what size shoe you wear? And he told me and I was like, what's your address? <laughs> I just ordered him some like Adidas Powerlift force yeah. and sent it to him. Listen, you gotta have you gotta have squat shoes. You gotta have a good bar. You do not have to have good weights. I think weights are like the last thing to buy. Yeah. Go with the old pig iron Craigslist weights. I mean, until you, you know, like nice weights are cool. Nice weights are like a nice car, not needed, but cool, but fun, but unnecessary. But a platform is a platform is necessary. Good barbell is necessary. Good shoes are necessary, and a and a belt from Dominion Belt. Nece- it, if you necessary. Have, if you if uh if you have solid flooring, I think a platform is way down the list. Like if you're on concrete right. or something like that, who cares? But if you've got carpet, even squat shoes aren't going to really help you that much. It's still squishy. You know, I, I'd get the platform. I'll tell you something. That and I and the platform's the cheapest thing you're going to do anyway. That's true because you, you just go by OSB from Lowe's and put horse stall mats on top of it. I, uh, my gym is on a, in a carpeted room now, and mm-hmm. I put a platform on top of the carpet. I kind of wish I'd torn the carpet up. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised how spongy it is still with a it. massive – so remember, my platform is a giant. It's a. It's a. It's actually an eight by twelve platform, eight wide, twelve deep. And then I got a a big whatever it is, an RML six on top of it, and two thousand pounds of weight, and it's still like spongy. Like yeah. I can feel the whole platform smashing against the carpet when I'm deadlifting or what. The deadlift, my deadlift bar bounces a lot when I when I set it down because of the carpet. That's not, I thought for sure it would just mash the carpet down after the first couple of weeks, but it stayed kind of spongy. Yeah, the carpet's runt anyway. Runt. That's what we say oh, in, for in sure. Oklahoma. Runt. Yeah, you'll take that platform off. And but the, the reason I kept the right. carpet in is because we shoot all the videos for Barbara Logic in there, and I need the sound. The sound yeah. was better with the carpet in there. Here's one. Hiram. I Hiram. like that. I like that a lot. You know, that was yeah. Hank Williams' name. Hiram. Uh, he's 33, 260 pounds, six foot one. Uh, he's benching 245, squatting 350, pressing 185, delicate 455. He says, I've started experiencing elbow pain on the outer elbow, outer elbow of my right elbow. arm. He said, I think it's called tennis elbow. The elbow is very tender to the touch. I have attached <laughs> a spreadsheet of your program. Well, thank you for that. Should I change my programming, et cetera? He says, I love the podcast. I have four kids. The oldest is six years, youngest is three months. My wife stays at home and is homeschooling. I really enjoy your life advice tangents. Well, thank you. And thanks for homeschooling thanks, his kids and not thanks, sending Hiram. them to the uh, minimum, minimum security uh, educational yeah. facility the, in your county. Raffs. I can't have that. You know, it's weird. I don't see that lateral epicondyle as often as I say medial epicondyle. And I don't know if this is true. You but get the I lateral lean all the towards, time, right? You get lateral all the time, don't you? 
I I used to get lateral all the time. Yeah. But I but this this would be my default answer and not know if it's actually true. If it's lateral, it's on the outside. I actually think it tends to be an issue. No, that's the other way. There we go. Laterals there. Yep. And medial is the other one. And so I think if medial is the issue, it's usually a squat problem. And it's exacerbated by the upper body. But I think if it's lateral, it's often an upper body problem. It's a bench press or even potentially a press problem. It could be a pull-up problem, not a chin-up problem. It could be a curl problem. I think it could still be squat. My guys it could that still get, be a squat. My guys that get the, the lateral bicep tendonitis are pulling on the bar as they come up out of the hole. Yes, sure. They're sure. pulling really hard on as the bar. As opposed to, but actually, it's a great point to make. They're pulling down on the bar. It's like they're trying they to bend it around their shoulders. Yeah. And and the medial epicondyls, the other way around, they're pushing it, and elbows, that's right, elbows come up, so the elbows kick up high, and they don't stay pinned down to the ribs, and they put lots of pressure on the base of their palm, and pushing against and so that seems to cause the medium. So you're right. It may be it may be squat on both if you're pulling. So if you're pulling on the bar, don't. Um, yeah. Feel he, the weight. Feel the weight on your back, man. That's the deal. You got to get the weight on your back. Your hands just hold the bar up. That's they don't do anything. Yeah, he he did send a um, he did send a screenshot here of his programming and he has dips and chins program, but he's not doing any. So I, I bet you're bending the bar. I bet when you come up out of the hole. You clench everything in your body to include your your jaw and everything, and you're you're yeah. pulling down on the bar as you come up out of the hole. It's yeah. really hard when we start doing this to learn how to exert some things maximally, but not all the things. Yeah, it's hard to not like oh, just clench your neck and your neck is yeah, sore, you and you're like you shouldn't pulling do. down on the bar. By the way, that didn't, that didn't just go for lifting. I remember reading Charlie Francis's book, who's the best track sprint coach of all time. And he talked about really good sprinters. If you watch them, they're from like the waist down. They're just, uh, they're a locomotive. They're mm -hmm. ch -ch 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 -ch, right. And their upper body is pretty smooth. You can see what I'm doing. Look at me look like an athlete with my sunglasses right now, just hitting you, this right here. It looks like I'm You look like fast. Kenny Powers. <laughs> Except a, a bald Kenny Powers. Hi Hypertensive Kenny, Kenny Powers. Powers. No Jerry Curl. <laughs> right. You know what? Anyway. The mullet is coming back. Have you been seeing you see these? It? Are you going to grow one? I asked Charity last night. I said, I've got this mustache. What if I grew a mullet too? And she's like, no. <laughs> mullet, mustache, and overalls. That'd be a great look. So, but he says the face, you, you, he's got these shots in his, in his, in his uh, sprint books of these, of these track. I'm talking about like Olympic level athletes. And their face is tense and their jaw is tight. Wrong. Bad. Right. And you'll see these guys like Usain Bolt. They're just like a locomotive from kind of like the chest down. And their face is just relaxed. You know, he's smiling to the crowd. He's relaxed right. in his face. He's not all like tensed up. And squats yeah. are the same way. Put that energy where it's supposed to be, which is in, uh, in hip the extension hips. and not uh, pulling the bar down. Uh, That's right. You know, we can't really relax our faces entirely because we've got a Valsalva. So we got to do some stuff up top, you know. But, um, but don't pull on that bar, man. Pinch your shoulder blades together. Um, and keep your back tight, but um, don't pull on the bar. Try to open your hands a little bit. Don't open them all the way up. Don't turn loose the bar, but just kind of open up your hands a little bit. That can help guys not pull on the bar. Try that. Yeah, Scott, the other, another Scott, an the inferior one. one, says, Clearly. warming up for one RM attempt. He says, a loyal podcast listener here and love the show as always. I recently took up the opportunity to experience a taste of BLOC with Nikki Berman. Really appreciated the opportunity to see how it all works and got some great feedback. Well, good, man. Thanks for signing up, douchebag. Ah, he's from Melbourne, <laughs> Australia. Listen, I'm just kidding. Hey, we got a lot of friends there. They got a lot of friends Joel? in Australia, not Melbourne, but, uh, but, well, it's but now Adelaide, we have But how big is Australia? What is that? Like the size of Rhode Island? Like North I'm America? I know it's massive. It's so big. There. Nobody knows, but it's like ninety-eight percent desert. Yeah, and and uh, like poisonous animals and like chlamydia-ridden bears and things. It's a really <laughs> odd place. But he says my question concerns preparing to attempt a one rep max. He says I'm okay. not preparing for a competition, but I think it's time in my training to see just how strong I've gotten. I'm pleased to be setting five and even three rep PRs, but I've not attempted a true one RM on any of the lifts. I'm training to be generally strong, but I did set some specific strength goals. 
apart from being fun, how I think it would be a confidence booster and a motivator to hit those numbers. Can you shed some light on how to warm up and prepare for the one rep max attempt? He's 44. Yeah. What do you think? My, my opinion about this has changed. Okay. Uh, if I was programming for you, you're the client. I'd help you however I could, but I'd be like, yeah, don't worry about it. Like don't even do it or yeah, don't just don't about stress it. about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. Man, I I like one rep max. They're fun. I just you yeah. just you just take your regular warm ups and you just back off your warm up reps from fives to threes to twos to singles and you just keep going up and hitting heavier singles and heavier singles and you you focus on really good form. I had a client not long ago who did a a new one. He were he's actually competing this weekend, but he had a new uh, one rep max test on both squat and deadlift several weeks ago is kind of a pre-peak to the meet mm -hmm. and um we and it's it's my fault but he had said you know i was like man you got to some form break down there and he said i you know you can't focus on form when you pull when you're doing that heavy i was like wrong yeah you can I yeah was like that's actually the only thing you should think about like now you can't think about very much like i think it's actually like a singular thing so for me on squats maybe it's like stay on midfoot or hold my knees back or Right. On, my, on a deadlift, it might be like finish squeezing my chest up before I push through the floor, or like whatever that thing is. But like to me, that's actually the thing that helps kind of focus you and center you on the thing. But I, I'm not against one rep max attempts. But if I was him, I'd be doing the MBD programming thing. And when it was time to do that, it would emerge. Yeah, sure. You sure. know, triples would have run out, doubles would have sure. run out. And that's and, what we do too. And I don't run out fives and threes like like uh, like maybe the practical programming book will tell you to do for an intermediate. I don't run them out like that. It's not like that. I'm still trying to maintain the volume, so there's going to be back offs being incorporated here, yeah, and so absolutely. on. But but you would you would get to the point there would be an emergent point where I had a a ninety eight percent certainty what your one rep max was, sure, and then you would do that. Yep. And I would work you up to it and give you some practice. Um, if you're going to go do this stuff and you're, and I'm not programming for you, <laughs> and you, you know, uh, and you're just going to go tr work up, I recommend, you know, you're, you've been doing three by fives. You got some five rep and some three rep PRs. Uh, go 20% over your three rep PR. Walk that out as a squat. Walk it out. Yep. Rack it. Um, the, you know, a session before. Walk that thing out and stand there with it for 20 seconds. Just feel something heavy on your back. Walk it back in. Uh, and then I would have you f do something like uh, 10% over your five rep for your squat. Do that for yep. a single. And then uh, use your judgment. You know, throw five pounds on there, throw 10 yeah, pounds on. Like, See, I don't know what your numbers it. are. So I don't know what, I don't you know, maybe maybe your, maybe your PR is 140 pounds and five pounds is too much. I, I don't know. Too much, yeah. But, but maybe 10% over your 5RM, walk it out, uh, video it, judge the bar speed. Put a little more on there and work up. Yep. Agreed. I, by the way, I think having an audience helps for most people. Like even if it's just your wife and kids. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, I think so too. Right. Have somebody come over. Music. Like I'm not one of these guys. I don't get like real riled up for heavy lifts. I don't. I'm not like a. I'm not a, a woo kind of guy. But I'm you know, I'll snort a little ammonia. But I I'm real quiet and I'm focused. But I like to. I like somebody watching me and putting some accountability on my shoulders. Mm. So I have a hard time lifting really heavy for like PRs in my home gym all by myself with nobody else in the room. It's yeah. hard to get psyched up enough to do it. I do fine. No people, problem, huh? Pe people are a drain on me. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, John says, I was interested in your brief discussion about a four-day linear progression during your Festivus rant episode. Don't remember that. Can you, you go into more detail? I remember detail? the Festivus rant, what but was I don't it? remember the discussion of the four-day split. What was the Festivus LP. rant? I don't remember that. The Festivus rant? We just went nuts on Christmas week about just, we just aired, we aired all of our grievances hmm. yeah, I don't remember about that. humanity in general. You don't remember that? That's every week. <laughs> that is true. We just, I have producer Trent cut most of yours out. He but says, we just let you go on Festivus week. He says, I was thinking that Scott has seemed less grumpy lately, but he made up for it in that podcast. Yeah, thanks. See? Uh, four day linear progression. Can I go into more detail about that approach? There's nothing to think about, man. Just do LP. It's just a four day split. It's a, it's a linear progression, two lower body days, two upper body days. Yeah. LP. That's it. So here are the choices you have to make. Like what exactly is the split, right? Are you going to do a squat bench? Oh, by the way, press. that's a great question. Yeah. I hate that. I hate it when people do that shit. When they, I think a four day full body thing is stupid. 
I'm just going to say it. Our friend Jordan Stanton does that. Likes it a lot. Well, Jordan Stanton's smart <laughs> and he's jacked, and he's got better genetics than me. Um, he probably can. I, I just think you're talking about a systemic stress on the body four times a week. I think that's often too much. Yeah, I like uh, the systemic stress of the upper and lower in one, in each session for advanced athletes early in their block. How about that? That's I would agree. For DUP type stuff, but we're talking about LP. Right. So I wouldn't L, so you're talking about a beginner who wants to go 4 days and go like two lower and two upper is typically what you do. So I just squat first and deadlift second every session because for squats as long as most I can, important. Yep, and and it warms you up fine for the deadlift, and it doesn't, you know. So you can do three sets of five on squats both sessions. You do like one set of deadlift, one one set of five deadlift on both sessions. You just keep going up. I press before I bench press, even though yep. I like the bench press better. But I think the press is a decent warm up for the bench press, and it doesn't tend to wear out the bench press. I think the bench press will wear out the press, which mm-hmm. is my experience. I don't know that I can prove that, but that's just my experience. And then, uh, you know, you might add one accessory movement maybe if you're a, a big boy maybe you do just a little bit of conditioning on the lower body days and maybe you do like chins on the upper body days and that's it and you get out and they're short sessions and you do four instead of three i think it works just fine do i think a three-day full body split works better yeah probably three-day full day split full body split works better but yeah I, I think most of the people that are interested in this just want to tinker well, sometimes you get people that like are trying to train on a lunch hour or something, and I think that, I think that's when it works well. If you're somebody just like, "Hey, I got an hour, or I got like 50 minutes by the time I change my clothes and get to the gym and work, and then change my clothes again and get back to work," I think that's a decent reason to do that kind of stuff. But 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 otherwise, if, but if you don't have a specific reason to do it, don't jack with it, man. We this stuff's already been thought through, has been experimented with. I don't know, 195,000 times successfully. Yeah. Just don't fuck with it unless you are completely crushed with time constraints in LP. Now, I by the way, I do do a four-day split LP all the time for my advanced lifters. If they're on a basic kind of four-day split, once they've peaked, so, you know, I get, you know, like Harry Fafudis or something will come yep. in. He's basically doing a four-day split anyway. He peaks, he does a meet or a PR week, and he comes back in. John Floater has done this a hundred times, like just so many times. I've got John Floater on a four-day split LP. Yep. But the guy's really, really strong. So he works his, you know, he works his squat up to 425 for three sets of five and his one set of five deadlift to like 505, 515 for sets of five. And and then we start to make adjustments and, you know, it's same thing. So, but if it's a true like first time LP, three day a week is probably better. By the way, yeah. my man and your man, our man, Salman. Salman. Yes. Yeah, you can check him out at, I think he's at Miami Barbell on uh, Insta Squeeze. Yep. He says, uh, he wrote me this today. He's got some shoulder troubles, and I, he's been a client of mine now for, I don't six know, months. six exactly. months at least. And, yep. uh, and uh, I, he, I haven't had him bench once because he's got some, some, some trouble. But he said uh, that he wanted to start benching a little bit. And he says, listen to this. I'm going to read this. He says, Scott. You are wrong about the press not driving the bench. I'll prove it to you. I've included two benching videos. The first is a PR 315 bench in August of 2018 when my press PR was 200. That was my last bench workout due to a shoulder problem. The second is a 335 bench PR in 2019, 10 months later when my press PR was 235. I did not bench one single rep in those 10 months. That's wild. He said, I just tested my bench that day to see how bad it was. I ended up hitting a 20-pound PR, and I had 350 in me that day for sure. It was a 35-pound bench PR by only training the press. Yeah, there you go. There you go. crazy? Uh, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Uh, I don't don't either. uh, So, yeah, I'll I'll accept that I'm uh, I'm wrong about that, but I will say this. The bench press drives the press better than the press drives the bench press. Ooh, I don't think so. I do. I would disagree. I don't know that I'm right, but the reason I say that is because for years I was a power lifter who never pressed mm-hmm. and only bench pressed. And I can remember being, and then when I converted to strongman, strong, strongmen don't bench in competition. They bench right. some in training, but everything's an overhead press for, for pressing. And I can remember I could, I could raw bench press over 400 pounds and I couldn't press 185. Hmm. It just, I just didn't have, man, I just didn't have the, Interesting. I had the shoulder mobility. I didn't have, and as soon as I started to press, I got my press from one eighty five to two hundred five to two twenty five to two forty five. My bench bench press jumped up again. Yeah, and when I say that, 
when I when I say that I'm um, I'm going basic mostly from my experience. Like I can just bench and get a bench PR and then press and get a press PR without hardly doing any pressing, and uh, pressing hurts my soul. So uh, I tend to push. I, well, I, I I can't I can't push it that much because it I mean it literally hurts me. Yeah, hurts your shoulders. It hurts me, and if I if I drive it towards PRs. I run off a cliff really quick. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, but you have to remember though, you're kyphotic and you're all yeah. kind of like tilted forward. True, so broken. you probably have a lot less space in that shoulder capsule than most. But, uh, old Salman, man, he's super strong. He's, uh, except for uh, he squats more than he deadlifts. So, well, we're, 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 we're getting there. You know, he pressed 190 for five by five the other day. Wow. Uh, strong. Uh, two, three by five at 210 or something like that. He's really, his, his press is going, going. I got going. a guy, I got a guy up in like the Pacific Northwest and he's pressing like 250 for a set of three. And then like two thirty for four sets of three back offs. That's <laughs> like it's crazy. That's just so strong. I Andrew pro- Jackson, Andrew Jackson's crazy strong too, and he's lost like he's like in the he's like two thirty eight body weight now. I'm gonna go throw acid on his face because he's so good looking. Yeah, he's that just like getting more jacked, and he's just too handsome. Tired of it. Super tired of it. More handsome. Yeah, dude, strong dude, strong. Lucas says low. An umbilia, umbilical hernia. He says, I enjoyed the Festivus Rant episode today. There you go. <laughs> this know. is how far behind we are. <laughs> I'm going to have to go March. listen to that. It's March, and that was from like the week before Christmas. He said, I had a physical last week and found out that I have an umbilical hernia. My doctor said Yay. I don't need to have it fixed. It does not hurt, but now I'm impa- I'm paranoid about my intestines blasting through my belly button. No, come on, man. That's not going to happen. Yeah, don't worry about it. I've had a million of those. Hernias are fun. I ain't your doctor. Uh, proceed true. with caution. Uh, but you're probably going to be okay, man. I have never seen... Look, listen, I've, I'm sure there's an outlier out there. I've never seen anybody's guts explode out through a hernia. Now, the downside, the potential risk of a hernia is it could become strangulated, right? So you get a mm-hmm. piece here like your small intestine or your stomach could poke through and it, and it cuts off the blood supply to that area. It's very rare. Typically, you can just kind of push it back in or it's not... It's not poking out very far, and it's not. It doesn't hurt too bad. It's got. A, it's a little bit painful, but not bad, and uh, you're fine. But if it's if it gets real painful and you can't kind of push it back in, and it feels like it gets worse and worse and worse over a period of three or four or five days, that's a problem. You got to go to fix. But if you just have a hernia, man, I've had. I had an umbilical hernia once. I know I've told. I'm sure I've told this story on the podcast. I had this guy, the surgeon. I actually was getting my my gallbladder out. I had a gallbladder attack, and I knew I had an umbilical hernia, which I had trained with for years. And I said, "Fix that! Can you fix that hernia?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, definitely, because we're going to do a laparoscopic. We're going to pull your gallbladder out laparoscopically." It's okay, perfect. So I said, "Please make sure you put the mesh in." Mm. And so he's like, "Got it." I said, "No, listen." At the time, I think it was a pro strongman, so I was like, "Listen, I'm a pro strongman. I don't think you understand the pressure I'm putting on my belly button." And so he's like, "Got it." And I was like, "Put the mesh in. Got it." So, of course, it's outpatient surgery, and you're all loopy. Your wife drives you home, and go back a week later, and he wants to tell me about the gallbladder surgery. I was like, how'd the hernia surgery go? He's like, I didn't put the mesh. I go, what? Why? He was like, well, the hole wasn't very big, and I was going to have to cut a little bigger hole to keep that put that rolled-up mesh in there. I said, yeah, that's what you should have done. He said, yeah, I just felt like it wasn't the right move. <laughs> Ten weeks later, blew the belly button out again. Yeah, we should fire him. He so stitched it a little bit. Yeah, how do you fire him. a surgeon? That's sue the problem. Him. You can't. Can't fire a surgeon. You still get the hospital bills. So <sighs> I had to go get it fixed again. And this time, now you know I've said this before. Now I'm I'm meshed from like the my breastbone down to my down to my taint. Mesh. It's like I, it's actually Kevlar. I had not put Kevlar. So if you shoot me in the belly, it's not gonna go through. It's gonna ricochet. Yeah, I mean if it's a pistol, if it's like you know you shoot me in the AK, it's probably going through. Garrett says, I would like to say that I originally came for the barbells, but the comments on society conspiracies, hamburgisms, and other rabbit holes keep me coming back. He says, I'm not asking for a Joe Rogan length podcast, but if it were possible to entertain an occasional rabbit hole episode, I would supremely appreciate it. <laughs> I should just let you record those every once in a while. Matt's too scared it. of that, guys. You, know, you, you don't understand. He's too scared. He's afraid. He's afraid of what the pill might do to him. No, that's not it at all. <laughs> but. It's a weird thing. You know, we started this podcast thinking nobody would listen to it. And now you're, you're getting hundreds of thousands of downloads every month. And all of a sudden I'm like, ah, now if we say something pisses everything off, the podcast doesn't really make any money. The service business makes the money. So, you know, I'm kind of like, hey, we got to be careful about what we say. I don't want to piss people off all the time. Matt's scared of the pill. He's afraid he'll, I'm choke, not he'll, afraid he'll choke to death on it. I'm scared that 30% of my clients don't want to hear it. They'll quit. They're the wrong clients. 
You can't nope. build. You can't build You're a business fine. on those. You can't build a business on those hey, guys. We get everybody strong. I don't care who you guys are. Even even the blue pillars. We love blue pill people. Get you strong. <laughs> I do not. Matt, Matt <laughs> the question is directed to Matt. He says, I enjoy the content you guys put out. On the last Q&A, the mention of four-day splits came up, and it got me thinking. For someone who's just finished the standard novice linear progression, is there a reason or benefit to doing both the bench and the press together in session A and the deadlift and squat together in session B? Yes. Is this superior that. compared to benching and squatting in session A? And pre- we just answered that question. We just answered that question. Next. Hey. Brian, thanks for sending that in. I mean, yeah, but some guy beat you to the punch by six minutes. See, the email. this just proves that I don't look at these questions beforehand because I read that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> we already did that one. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Jason says, love the podcast. I started strength training earlier this year, and for the first time in my life, I have found something that I enjoy to keep me consistent at being physically active. I'm stronger than I've ever been and healthier than I've been in years. Everybody says that. Nobody doesn't. That's Nobody right. except you know people that do it three times and just quit. Right. Like if you, if you do it for three weeks or more, certainly six weeks or more, everybody says the same thing. And then the third thing they say is, I wish I'd started earlier. Yep. Everybody says that. So even, if if they, even if they started at 17. Right. Like, I wish I started at 13. It, so if you, I can't imagine. Do you think there, well, I know there's at least one listener that listens to this show who doesn't weight train. I'm sure. But, you know, if you're that guy or any of the others, you know, it's time to start. He says, I'd say 60% of the time, one of the, pot, one of the hosts doesn't weight train. Which one is that? <laughs> it's me. <laughs> well, I've been struggling, man. It's been a crazy... Actually, I've been training pretty hard the last... I've, I've been training hard for a while. My aching ass. I'm serious. Send me your training logs. I'll help you with your programming. Yeah, it hurts, man. I'm so sore. I've been so sore lately. I'm training. Uh, I hate it. You hate training? Yeah, I do. I love it. I just, I just you know... I do. You, you know, I get hate mail about that. They're like, how can you talk about this if you hate... It's like... Do, do do diabetics love sticking themselves? Right. But you got to do it. It's medicine. Right. Did, did, did Professor Paul love radiation or, or chemo or whatever it was? No. Right. Like, I'm rational. I'm a human. Yeah. So I can do things I don't like. I can use my rationality and decide that it's good for me and do it anyway. Yeah. I don't have to be a, 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 a goddamn monkey and, like, push a button and get a pellet I get a little dopamine rush off of everything I do. Yeah. He says, I'm 31, six foot four, and 322. Um, uh, he's doing LP on a four day split. He big did, boy. Yeah, he's a big kid. Uh, three by five squat at 320, his deadlifts at 360. Uh oh, he's that guy. Five by three press at 155, bench press at 255. I tried to add a banded chins and even with the widest, thickest band, they were uncontrollable. And I did fat guy drops that gave me tendonitis. <laughs> fat guy drops. Yeah. Uh, since then, I've been using assisted chin machine with the intent of working up to where I can switch back to using the bands on a bar. I started at three. My gym also has a lat pull down. Would the lat pull down be more effective to work up than using the bands? Huh, that's a good question, actually. What do you think's better? I, so, you know, this guy actually has access to the like the Gravitron machine where you can just yeah. remove some of your body weight and still do chins. I actually think that's that's a great piece of equipment that most people don't have access to. I, I would say use that first. Yeah. I think that that's basically what we're doing with ban- a banded chin up, right? Is we're taking some some of our body weight off, but it's, you know, if you weigh 330 pounds, it's hard to do. So that I would just keep doing that that assisted pull-up machine is probably what I would do. Um, I do like lat pull downs. I love lat pull downs. Mm-hmm. Actually, I think it's a really good lat exercise. But I, I don't. My experience is that while it kind of makes sense, it should make you better at chins. It doesn't. Your lats it's not the strong. same. You can do that lay back with the lats and yeah, turn it it's into just, a barbell row. You know, or whatever. Yeah, it's not. It's not the same. It, yeah, I like the that uh, that assisted machine is probably better. Yep, agreed. Elijah says I was recently diagnosed with moderate obstructive sleep apnea. Do you have any recommend, recommendations for a CPAP or an auto pap? I travel at least once a month for work. No. I mean, I, so I get my CPAP. This is, you know, hashtag not a sponsored. I get them from CPAP.com. I've got, I've got a concierge doctor, so I can just get on CPAP.com when it's time to order a new CPAP and be like, Hey, you know, Dr. Spencer called this thing in. So he calls it in and sets it up. And I just, I, I just order it online. 
I, I was thinking, so I've started to, in these, I've done these, some of these travel trips lately, and I normally have to check a bag. I check a bag. But I, this last trip, I just, I was in Boise, Boise. That Locals call it Boise. Did you know that? Boise, Idaho. They're like, that's how you know the locals from the tourist. If you say Boise, it's not right. It's Boise. But anyway, I was in Boise. And uh, I didn't check a bag. Just took a, just took a big e-bags backpack. And my life was so much easier. But I also had to carry my CPAP. It's a medical device, so I can carry it on the plane, too. And I thought to myself, man, if I get one of those travel CPAPs, I could put that in the backpack, too. Because my CPAP is in a bag that's probably 14 by 14 by 5. It basically eight. looks like a uh, Campbell Hausfield air compressor. <laughs> it's not what it looks like. Oh. It feels like that, though, on my nose. Right. But, uh, man, CPAP.com, they've got all the... Uh, they got all the reviews you just i just pick one that's got the best reviews uh he it. says uh any thoughts about strength training in the inspire implant system i don't I, know what that is well i went and looked it up it's something implant i guess it, it, but there's something implant and then you have a little remote a little um remote control thing and you lay down to go to sleep you hit the remote and it hold this implant holds your airway open i don't know anything about it what but i don't yeah they put surgery like in your throat the back of your throat to it hold said your airway, airway. I, I just looked quickly while we were on online here or while we were recording i um i have never heard of that i don't want implanted things in my body i'd rather strap a hose to my face and have somebody put some shit in me sorry but I that's just me it, so, it sounds interesting but once you get used to a CPAP, and it takes a while to get used to a CPAP, it takes a while to get used to whatever mask you're going to wear, you kind of the whole gas mask, face mask, or the nose, or the nose hole. You put that implant pillows. in, and then uh, Twitter will buy that company, and then Jack Dorsey will deplatform you and close your airway off, and you'll just die. That's right. Or maybe he'll just speak on behalf of you. Right. So, like <laughs> his like, voice, just Dorsey's voice uh, just uh, comes yeah, out of yeah, your voice. <laughs> Jake says... I'm curious, in your coaching experience, what frequency seems to be most effective for the main lifts with intermediate and advanced lifters? Dude, he says he's a big fan of the podcast and looks forward to hiring you guys. And my wife and I are done having babies and surgeries. Well, we'd love to have you. Uh, I think every show we've ever done is about this. Yeah. He Lower body, that, two times a week. Yeah. Upper body, a total of five times a week. Three, press, three presses, two benches, or three benches, two presses seems to work best for... Later intermediate and advanced people. Yeah. Four day split works just fine for intermediates. Three day full body works just fine for beginners. There's your blanket statement. He says, uh, I basically ran out of progress on the four day Texas method, and the idea of squatting and deadlifting once a week is appealing to me. He's 32 mm -hmm. years old uh, and 5'9 and 245. I know, I know a lot of older guys who will squat and pull once a week or squat and pull every other week. How old is he? He's 32. I, I don't think that's for you, dude. I think you dude, need to squat twice 32. a week. Uh, I think you're he, just lazy. No yeah, you squat need to squat twice, twice a week. A week. Uh, Do you have a, how many of your clients squat and deadlift only once a week or less? None. Me neither. None. None. And I've got some fairly old and fairly brittle people. I've got a guy who's yeah. in his 70s, won't eat enough food, um, and, and he squats three times a week. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it's like on, on a kind of a heavy light. You just kind of have thing. to squat and deadlift twice a week plus. You, you don't have to, but it's pretty I, rare. It's it's an outlier that doesn't. You know, um, I'm 45, blah blah blah, and I've, I've been squatting once a week for a while. Just detraining. I can't even get close to even maintaining anything. We right. talk about maintenance. I mean, I can't do. I'm talking squatting once a week is for me at this point in my life is a waste of time. Right. Like I need to either squat you're, twice a you're week, just pulling weight off the bar every week, or go and go for it twice a week, and you know with conscientious just, programming, just or just not F, even worry about F it. it and not drain. Yeah, because right. I'm telling you, squatting once a week is getting me nothing but irritated. It's a waste. Yeah, right, right. Um, both both emotionally and physically irritated. Yeah, you're just pissed off mentally and physically. Yeah, it's ter it's terrible. Um, oh, this is interesting. David says. I have what I think is a typical story for a lot of guys. Somehow, somehow, he has sent this to us in the smallest font possible. Oh, that's fun. Let me put my spectacles on. Oh, my God. And his salutation is sola scriptura, sola fide. There we go. Oh, my gosh. Listen, got guys. Hey, listen, got for all you guys, for all you uh, sola fide guys, faith without understanding is but superstition. 
So I have what I think is a typical story for a lot of guys. I was active in high school playing football, wrestling, and track. I graduated at 5'11 and 165. After my wife and I had kid number six, good work. I was up to 365. Now at 37, I'm at 335. Good job on getting that done, man. He said, I started across, uh, I stumbled across your method and started to read up on it and started to train. I found your videos on YouTube and used those to learn technique. I then found your podcast a short time later. By the end of the summer, I was the strongest I'd ever been. Then in late August, I started to have a backache, which led to a muscle weakness. No, that is not true. Not true. But then he says, and numbness and everything from three inches above my belly button down. That was not the strength training that did that. Um, eventually getting bad enough, I could only walk with assistance. After getting an MRI, they found I had a bony growth. There you go. That was putting pressure on my spinal cord and the doctors performed a thoracic laminectomy at T4 to T6. From what I gather, the surgery involved cutting my spine, removing the top cap, cleaning out the canal for the spinal cord, then screwing the cap back in place and then fusing the vertebrae together. Since the surgery, I've been asking about when I can get back to the gym and everyone just laughs at me. The doctors have put me on a five to 10 pound weight restriction for four to six months. And the physical therapist have told me that I may not ever be able to do the core lifts again. Yeah, obviously. That seems like a lot of- Just die, dude. Right. First off, what I would do is don't do anything. File for disability and just cash that motherfucking check. And Get then, them opioids. And then train. By the way, I'm that's I'm being sarcastic. What a what a waste! Come on, man, you know better than this. You listen to the yeah, podcast. Yeah. He says, "At what hey, point can I tell?" Slow. He says, "At what point can I tell the doctors and physical therapists to get lost and start lifting again?" Man, that's a personal decision that you're going to make there, David. Um, I can't tell you when to tell <laughs> to tell you're paid. Uh, I can tell you what I would do. Uh, uh, I won't tell David what to do, but I would say what I would do. Yeah. Which I, I would tell the, the, and I understand why they say this, but I'd just be like, listen, go F yourself. That's not what I do. I'm going to do my thing. And I would start slow and I wouldn't, you know, put, I wouldn't put a ton of moment on my back in the beginning. I probably wouldn't low bar squat. I'd probably high bar squat in the beginning. You know, certainly if that, where he's got that's not right where the bar is, but it's a little bit below I, it. I wouldn't I, even squat. I'd just rack pull for a while. Yeah, just deadlift and just do your, but like, dude, you got to get strong. Like, what's, it's, How's five to ten pounds? You just got to detrain and get weaker and weaker and weaker and expose that area to vulnerability. So you got to get stronger at some point. If I'm not mistaken, Deaton, Darren, Darren Deaton, doctor of physical therapy, Darren Deaton has had this done as well, if yep. I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and you know, he squatted 350 for three by five last night on Instagram. I saw it, you know. Yep. Uh, you, you can do it. I don't at know how 53 long. 53 or whatever he is. Yep. I don't know how long ago your surgery was. Uh, the doctors are saying a weight restriction for four to six months. Hey, m- maybe that's in. Maybe that's maybe that's right. Yeah, but five to you, ten pounds well, for four to six months. That seems you know, a little conservative, kid. Well, sure, but I get it. But, but I get it. I don't get sued either on this thing. But, but a year later, five years later, ten years yeah, later, right. like you never you might do not, anything. You might not ever be able to do the lifts again. Like right. what? Right. So I know one thing, you're, you, you weigh 335, and uh, box squats ain't nothing if you're weighing 335. Chances are you weigh more than that now because you've been immobile for a time. Um, so you, you need to get back to work. Go listen to 40 Fit Radio and uh, D- Deaton. We've got some physical therapists that work, doctors of physical therapy that work at uh, Barber Logic Online Coaching. Uh, you know, y- you need to get some help. You need to get back in there. you got six kids and mama that need you to be a full-fledged human being that can move around and interact yep. with the world. And uh, Give decent hugs, at least. Yeah. One uh, more? Hey, I'm pulling for you, David. And remember, yeah, superstition's a problem. Felicia says, female listener number 22, again, she's been in here before. Excellent. Hey, Felicia. She Bye, says, Felicia. Hey. She says, I have a nutrition question. I'm 30 years old, five foot six, 137. I've gained 12 pounds since starting training in 2016. Uh, but I've uh, petered out in weight gain for about a year now. I'm still really lean and looking to add a bit more lean mass to my frame. I've been ramping up my calorie intake. I've already been shooting for 150 grams of protein a day, but looking for advice which med- macro is better to go heavy on, carbs, fats, or is it not necessarily matter? I'm a big fan of Ovaltine, she says. <laughs> <laughs> Ovaltine. You know, I've, I've never o- o- had I've- Ovaltine. Never? No. I haven't had it since I was about eight. I have had Carnation Instant Breakfast. Yes, I've had that too. I have had Nesquik. Nesquik's delicious, dude. That's the, that's the shit. That's so good. What you do is you get that can of Nesquik. Does it still have the metal lid you pry off yeah. with the spoon? I, you get them at Sam's or Costco because they're mm-hmm. like, 
<laughs> it's like a huge gallon of it. Whatever the directions say, triple it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't. Gatorade. Yeah, like, powdered Gatorade's the same way. Right. Just go strong. It's like coffee. Just go strong. Sister, I would have you eat 165, 70 grams of protein or maybe more. Yep. You know, uh, you know, hey, listen, join up for a little while. Use Jillian. Uh, she's been on the show. She can help you more than than I could. But I would bump your protein up because I know you can tolerate it. Nobody ever got fat on protein, as far as I can tell. And then add some carbs. You know, titrate it up and see what happens. You know, watch your waist. Do the little, uh, go get a DEXA scan or put a tape on your waist or do the Jackson, you know, fat pinch Pollock. and what, yep, what's, your, watch your, uh, watch your body fat and just see what happens, right? And you make small agree. changes. Yeah, if you think about it, like protein is the thing that builds the muscle and either carbs or fat give you the fuel. But because of the way we train, our, our training is going to be, carbs are going to be a preferential fuel source for, for strength training over fat. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if you do aerobic-based training, oxidative training, fat could, you could at least argue that fat could potentially be preferential. But that's not what we're doing. We're lifting. So carbs are the place to go. But yeah, I would max out the protein first. Same. Okay, we're going to do one more. This is going to be it. Okay. This question, Tony sent this in. And it does, this question irritates me. Not that Tony sent it, but I just get versions of this all the time. Uh, Tony says, first off, thanks for all the great free content. I'm about to hit the two, three, four, five milestone and attribute a great deal of my progress to the info you provide. Thank you, man. Good thanks, for man. you. Good for you. Uh, you say you attribute a great deal of the progress to the info we provide. Nope. You moved the barbell. It was, it's you. But he said, I think it was episode 259 where you mentioned not chasing PRs all year long. And it occurred to me that the statement sounded almost like a nod to maintenance, which, listen, if you say that something I said sounded almost like, whatever you say after that is fucking wrong. I always say precisely what I meant. Yeah. Oh, it seems like, it sounds, no. Feels like. I like feels, feels like. like. It feels uh, like what you're saying is. I got something you can feel. <laughs> Um, but I, but I get, I, I get, I get what you're saying here, man. I get what you're saying, but you cannot, I've been trying to maintain my squat. You can't do it. You can't do it. We didn't say you can't try. You can try. It is hard to chase numbers 365. If you're it really is, I mean, bot, not in the beat, not the first year, probably the first year you can chase numbers and no problem, but shit, the by first year three or five, you take some yeah. like charity, like your wife, how does she, she can't chase numbers. 12 months out of the year. She can't press in the 160s right. all it's the time. Too, she can't do yeah, it. It's just right. It's, it's, it's the same. You start, when you get that strong, you literally have to develop an off season, much like a, a basketball player or a football player or a baseball player would have. They train real hard for the season. They train during the season. They peak for the playoffs or whatever. And then they, they, they cruise a little bit. Nothing wrong with that. Like, especially if you're really, really strong. But um, yeah, that, that's what we're saying. So, so how that, often do you get in that? I have this conversation with my wife a lot where it's not, I'll make a blanket to say, in my experience is that in general, my wife especially, um, but also other, <laughs> I other women that I've known, going. well, often, you know, if, if you like, if you ask, my experience is if you ask a lady how things are going and she says, fine, we know in fact that they are not fine. That's a guarantee. But if you ask me if things are fine, and I say fine, or if you got how things are going, and I say fine, they're fine. Mm -hmm. All like, and then and then like my wife's like, "How's it going?" I'm like, "Fine." She's like, "Oh God, what's wrong? What do you mean what's wrong?" I said it's fine, and what she means is when I when she says it's fine, it's not. But when right. I say it's fine, it's fine. Everything's fine. I always say exactly what I mean, all the time. <laughs> oh, that's where we were going with that. Okay, I thought that was related to maintenance somehow. No, no people just, will say you know. it seems like. Yeah. Well, so what you're saying is no. I've always said exactly so, what I needed to say. So what you're saying is that's that's yeah. the best one. Yeah. Have you ever had a positive email that had so what you're saying is in it? I have. I have one friend, Miles. He's always I'll say something and then he makes it absurd and he always, then he says so what you're saying is that all all women are liars. <laughs> right. When, you, when, like, when your wife fact, says not fine, what I said so, at all. And I'm like no, that's not what I said. <laughs> right. Uh, um. So when I say maintenance, like there's a there's an idea among some folk that they can get fairly strong and then they can pick a number that's doable for them. So let's say they get their squat to 360 for five. And then they pick a number that's doable for them, like 315 for three by five. And they're like, I'm just going to, I'm going to, this is where I'm going to be. 
I'm just going to squat 315 for three by five every squat workout for the rest of my life. Right. No, maybe I'll do a little of this and I'll do a little of that. But you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna That's stand on this three fifteen for three by five. Yeah. And, and you can't do that. Doesn't work. But I'll tell you what, another thing you can't do is chase PRs every single day of your life. That's right. Into uh, their social security years. Yeah. Uh, you can do it. I mean, you said four or five years. Once you're into it, four or five years, you just can't chase them all the time. Yep. So what you end up doing. I'll talk about Charity, for example. I'm not doing her program. Andrew Andrew Jackson is doing her programming. But if I were doing her programming, I would probably put her through, like, you finish nationals at the end of 2019. So here at the beginning of 2020, I probably would have had her do some work to lose some weight. Not that she was too big, but she's a weight class competitor, we can't chase numbers all the time. Her shoulders, her her butt joints just can't sure. take it. So we wouldn't maintain because you can't. So what I would end up having her do is lose some weight for a while. Right. The the goal changes. So it's not that. Well, I'm I'm she's, still programming her to, to have a win maybe at nationals. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, in the moment, in the block, even, you know, she's come out of this like where the only thing that matters is getting stronger. Yep. Body weight doesn't really matter. Like getting beat up only matters to the point that it affects you getting stronger like but the goal is strong and then you go through another block where you're like hey now the primary goal right now which is still going to benefit us 12 months away in winning nationals is hey let's lose a little weight let's lose some fat let's put on a little muscle let's build up some work capacity let's do some conditioning let's enjoy ourselves in the gym like, right. whatever those like, things are and then she'll yeah, go through so we and know. Then she'll go into the next block we know if she's going to get stronger, she has to put on muscle mass. So that's heavy. That's right. And I want her to be in the same weight class. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to work backwards from that. Well, she needs to lose a little bit of fat for a little while. And then we need to put, do some hypertrophy. And then, well, I actually probably need to work back uh, some, up some uh, capacity to handle heavy weights, then do some hypertrophy stuff. And then you can yep. run a couple of blocks and now it's nationals. But you yep. didn't chase PRs except for right. um, maybe, the last three, maybe four, months. four total weeks out of 52 weeks. Right. Like you're working sure. up to it with your blocks. Sure. But but uh, you you just can't do it all the time. It'll just beat you up. I can I can do. I have found that I can do a press PR attempt about twice a year. Right. Because it's just too heavy for me to run up to. Wrecks it. Like my you next specifically the press. Yeah, the press specifically wrecks you. Yeah. You just can't well, do it. Can't do it. Uh, d deadlift too, frankly. I mean, I I ain't got no business pulling over five hundred, four, five, six times a year. Right. Maybe that maybe that ain't heavy for some people, but that's just what it is. Sure. So uh, there you go. You, what you end up doing, even to maintain, is you have to get, like if your 315 number is the number, you have to run up beyond that. And then you go do something else for a little while, and then you run up beyond it. You ain't ever standing still. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. Yep. If I could squat but again, 315. you can change the goal. So you say you're getting better or you're getting worse. If the overall goal is to get stronger, you can't just get stronger all the time. But you can change the goal and say, hey, the goal is to get in a little better shape. The goal is to lose eight pounds. The goal is to – and you can do those things. And so you sure. could theoretically get better if, as long as you keep changing the goal. But if the – you know, if the single – think about Usain Bolt. If the singular goal for a sprinter is to just go out every single time and break the world record in the 100-meter sprint, like you can't do that. There's all sorts of like – got to lay the groundwork for that stuff. Yeah, if you go back and listen to that episode uh, we did, I can't remember the what number, but on Zatsiorsky's uh, Science and Theory of Strength Training, yeah, uh, where we talk about the dual factor theory that he talks about, where you have uh, a, an athletic potential, uh, which is damaged or subtracted from by the amount of fatigue present in your system. Yep. If you just look at that graph, you'll realize that you can't run up against that maximum athletic potential all the time. Sure. And the higher that potential is, the less frequently you can run to it. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. a snow plow. Like if you got a plow in the front of your truck, you start pushing snow. Well, you, you get to the point where there's so much snow in front of it, the truck won't move. Right. And the fatigue is like that. And, um, well, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's a biological yeah. fact. You have to reset at that point. Yeah. And make some changes. Yeah, good. and then and then you have to disrupt homeostasis. And three by five for three fifteen twice in a row will not disrupt homeostasis. Right. And so you will adapt to less stress, 
which means pretty soon 295 is hard, right? Oh, gosh, there's a long question and answer session. Send your questions to questions at barbell-logic.com. And if you want another Festivus-style rant, I don't know. I'll work on Uncle Matt. We'll see if I can build up his uh, his tolerance. I uh, Renault tolerance. Yeah, and like they, I said, they I said like the other a day. Swir- you know, like a, you remember the old ice, the ice cream cones when you were a kid that were like half chocolate, half vanilla? Could I do like a half blue, half red? No, nope, you can't do it. It's like milk. You put a little chocolate in there, it's chocolate milk, period. Ooh, I do love a little chocolate milk. Nope, can't have a lot. It's, it's, it's red pill or nothing. I can't just have a little red? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Uh, well, there's that. Go to iTunes, leave us a re- review, Spotify, whatever. You know, you can go to Spotify, by the way. If you have a Spotify premium account, maybe you can do this with the cheap one. I'm not sure. But if you've got the premium one, you can go to our show, and you can hit share, and you can share our show to your Instagram stories. There you go. Maybe or you should Facebook do that instead of review. That's things. how easy would that be? Yes. That'd be a big help to us and let us let some other people know about what we do over here. And I hope you guys have enjoyed the MED series. There'll be some more of that stuff going on. I've got some ideas from some uh, content shows that Matt Matt needs to uh, he needs to bite on. But here's the problem with Matt, guys. I'm like, hey, let's do this. He's like, ah, oh, that'll take a little prep. I can't do it. <laughs> oh, it hurts because it's true. I'm like, yeah, man, we need to we need to just take another chapter. We need to take take like chapter one out of super training. He's like, oh man, I'm just covered up. Bro, I'm so slammed I can't do it. It is true actually. Both are true. I both say that and it is in fact true. So and then meanwhile, oh shoot I, on the online great books podcast, I'm like, what are we going to read for next week, Carl? He's like, let's read Dune. It was 800 pages. I slammed <laughs> for next it. week. Yeah, no shit. I'm not kidding you. 125 then, pages a day. And he's like, let's read Lord of the Rings for next week. I'm like, you mean the first one? He's like, no, he's let's like, read them. Let's just read the whole trilogy. Yeah, I read all three of them. We did. We oh did two. God, that's crazy. <laughs> that's Carl. Shoot. And I'm then, jealous. I'm jealous of your time. And then. uh uh, then when I suggest stuff, I'm like, let's read The Metaphysics of Love by Arthur Schopenhauer. Yeah, 20 pages. Right. <laughs> Bourbon neat. Ah. Well, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will talk to you on Monday. <laughs>